예, 안녕하세요. 어, 저 현대경제연구원장을 맡고 있는 강인수입니다. 어, 이번 세션은 뭐 여기 책자를 보시면 아시겠지만 어, 두 분이 어, 발표를 해주십니다. 이 전체 뭐 포괄하는 주제를 이렇게 딱 집어내기는 어렵지만 그첫 번째가 이제 프로스펙트 어, 2020 글로벌 크라이시스라는 주제고 두 번째 주제가 리더십 체인지 어몽 더 차이니스 인더스트리라는 주제로 발표를 해 주실 텐데 어, 두분그 연사분을 좀 간단하게 에, 소개를 먼저 좀 드리겠습니다. 우선 어, 로저 베이커 여기 계신 분인데 에, 로저 베이커 씨는 이제 그 셀프라는 그 전략 분석하는 어, 뭐 유수의 어, 기관입니다. 여기에 어, 97년부터 어, 근무를 하고 계시고요. 지금 어, 바이스 프레지던트 직을 맡고 계십니다. 그래서 이분이 뭐 워낙이 이쪽에 이제 오래 해오셨고 어, 전공은 뭐좀 뭐 다양하시더라고요. 그래서 그 학부는 바이올로지를 하셨고 어, 사우샘턴 칼리지에 사셨는데 또 MA는 석사는 어, 밀리터리 히스토리를 어, 노르웨이 유니버시티에서 하셨거든요. 그래서 전체적으로 이제 제가 아까 들어오기 전에 좀 이렇게 어, 좀 대화를 해 보니까 어, 이게 이제 그 전략이라고 하는 게 되게 광범위하잖아요. 광범위한데 이제 상당히 여러 분야를 하시더라고요. 물론 여기 전공을 살려서 뭐이 군사적인 문제도 물론 커버를 하시지만은 예를 들면 뭐 자원이나 뭐 석유 같은 거 그리고 여러 가지 이 자원들이 많이 있지 않습니까? 이런 것들이 이제 큰 흐름을 보는 거죠. 세계 전체적으로 어떻게 될것 같다라는 걸 보고. 큰 판단을 해주는 그래서 그이 해주는 그 대상 분들이 이제 뭐 세계적으로 알려진 어 다국적 기업들이 대부분 어뭐 고객사라고 그러십니다. 그래서 상당히 이제 에 단순한 어떤 애널리스트가 아니고 큰 흐름을 이 평가해 주실 수 있는 오랜 경험을 가지신 분이시니까 이따 좀잘 듣고. 플로어에서 어, 질문을 많이 해주시기 바랍니다. 그리고 이제 이두 번째 이 리더십에 관련돼서 어, 발표해 주실 어, 피터 에베르 씨는 지금 어, 콘페리라는 회사에 지금 재직을 하고 계신데 뭐 아시겠지만은 리더십 분야에 그러니까 재능 리더십 이런 분야는 뭐 세계에서 가장 큰 컴퍼니입니다. 그리고 뭐 어, 전 세계 그 80개 도시에 어, 서울에도 있습니다. 서울에 있는데 80개 주요 도시에 어, 사무소를 다 가지고 있고 뭐 많은 그 다국적 기업 포함한 뭐 공공기관 포함해서 또 인적 자원과 관련된 부분 뭐 어, 교육을 담당하시고 상담을 해주시고 그, 그런 걸 하셨는데 지금. 이번 이 전체 <웃음> 이, 이 글로벌 아, HR 포럼 금년도 주제하고는 아주 부합하는 어, 전공자신 것 같아요. 그래서 이 이력이 특히 이제 중국이 요즘에 워낙에 에, 뭐 빨리 성장을 했고 그리고 나서 최근에 이제 뭐 약간 성장률이 조정을 받고 있지만은 중국의 에, 그 중요 지도자들한테. 에, 어떤 리더십에 관련된 어, 어드바이스를 직접 해주고 계시거든요. 그래서 지금 이따가 말씀을 하시겠지만 뭐그 중국 4.0, 뭐 차이나 4.0, 뭐 이런 표현으로 되는데 그 키워드가 키워드가 엔터프레니시브하고 이노베이션이라고 합니다. 그러니까 어떤 기업가 정신과 혁신이라고 하는 거에 대해서 어, 우리한테도 절실하게 지금 필요한 뭐 이런 사안들인데 워낙에 그 케이스나 이런 것들도 많고. 사례들도 많고 중국에서도 뭐 적극적으로 그걸 채택하기로 지금 어, 했다고 하기 때문에 뭐 많은 어, 디스커션이 있다가 좀 이루어지기를 바랍니다. 그래서 
이번 세션은 뭐 여기 지정된 토론자는 따로 없기 때문에 두 분이 각각 한 30분 정도씩 발표를 하시고 30분 정도는 이제 자유롭게 그 플로어에서 질문을 하시면은 어 그거에 대한 답변을 하는 뭐 그런 시간을 갖도록 하겠습니다. 그래서 어 말든 지금부터 첫 번째 그 연사이신 로저 어 베이커 어 바이스 프레지던트신데 이분 그 뜨거운 박수로 어 환영해 주시기 바랍니다. 굿 애프터눈 안녕하십니까 한국말 조금만 하세요 so, I'm going to speak in English he can speak in Korean um, so today I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, well I was asked to talk about a global crisis in 2020 and I would raise two things about that to start off with one 2020 is next door it's very soon we're almost the end of 2016 it's a really short amount of time um, number two, crisis may be an exaggeration. It may not be a crisis in the way in which we want to think about, or we usually think about a crisis or a major um, disruption, but rather I think that what we're seeing is a huge change in the trends in the way in which the world system is working and operating. And uh, we work at our company from the baseline of geopolitics, so we look at a holistic worldview. We look at geography, we look at um, politics, economics, security, society, uh, technology, history, and the way all of these have interplayed over time, and how those not only shape a region or a space, but the way in which they interact and the way in which they go forward. So there's some who refer to geopolitics as both interpreting the past, understanding the present, and giving us a vision of the future. And so what I'm going to do is work us from the past to the present to understand where we are now, and then lay out some of the uh, aspects that are really going to be changing as we look forward. And so to begin, I want to there we go, point this somewhere where it works. Um, to begin, I want to talk about a, a virtual 20-year cycle. And this is not a real 20-year cycle. There is no 20-year cycle. But what I would argue is that what you see and what you expect is probably, as you're looking forward, the least likely of what you're going to get. Linearity is just not a natural state for um, nations, uh, for people. Um, that's just not how it works. Uh, so I want you to move back in time with me. And we're going to start in the summer of 1900. And in the summer of 1900, if you read the newspapers, if you read the, the primary views of the world, there is a very a clear agreement that this is the dawn of a new European century, that London is the center of this European century, that economic integration now has grown so strong, effectively what they refer to uh, as, as globalization, has grown so strong that the European powers can never fight each other because fighting each other is going to cost too much economically. They might fight out in the provinces and out in the colonies, but they're not going to fight in the European uh, continent. And that is the very real belief that everyone holds. If you were to move 20 years later into the summer of 1920, what you're going to see is a world where Europe has been devastated by one of the most significant wars that it has ever seen in its history that that whole idea that economic integration would stop the propensity for war was absolutely wrong. In fact, the economic integration in some way drove the, the move towards war. The United States, which is only a few decades out of its own civil war, has come across the Atlantic, resolved the war at the very end, and then run back across the Atlantic and hidden again. Um, if there is a, a common belief, though, it is that there will never be another European war. They, called it not, they didn't call it World War I. They called it the Great War. Not a great war, the Great War, the war to end all wars. Germany would never again be allowed to act in that way, and it certainly wouldn't, because everybody understood the devastation that would happen. Go to the summer of 1940, and Germany is knocking on the British door. There's a general understanding that Germany may have succeeded in unifying Europe as a single entity. That the reality is going to be going forward, a largely unified Europe, German leadership in the center, uh, operating through that space, and that's how the world is going to be shaped going forward. If you were to jump another 20 years forward, Germany is divided between the Americans, again jumping across the Atlantic, and the Soviet Union, this sort of upstart nation that had come out of the collapse of the Russian Empire. And at this point in time, thinking forward, there are a few realities. One, if there's going to be another war, it's going to be a global war, and it's probably going to be fought with nuclear weapons. Number two, um, that you're going to have 
a, a condition where, at least at this point in 1960, technologically and probably economically, the United States is going to be the winner. And that the US is on the ascendant track, and the Soviets are really struggling to keep up. If you jump forward another 20 years, I'm in school, and my teachers are telling me I have to learn Russian because the Soviets won the Cold War. Um, and this is, this is repeated later. I'm told I have to learn Japanese because the Japanese won the economic war 20 years later, and so on. This cycle continues. Now I have to learn Chinese. Um, at some point, I'll learn Korean. Um, and, and what's interesting is that there was no nuclear war, but the United States certainly didn't win. It may have even been defeated by a very small power in Southeast Asia. Um, Soviets seem like they have moved forward technologically far in advance of what the United States is capable of. Their military strength is growing. The U.S. starts to say we need to have more focus on STEM education because the Soviets are better at, at technology and they're better at science. Um, and it's kind of clear that the Cold War is pushing towards an end and probably the United States is going to be the loser of the Cold War. You move forward another 20 years, there is no Soviet Union. It's dissolved. The United States is the sole global power. It's the only entity out there. There is no nation in the world that's capable of challenging the United States. There's going to be no challenge to the United States. Globalization has reasserted itself, and globalization guarantees that economics is going to supersede geopolitics, and you're not going to have any more war. Well, we're in a very different world now, aren't we? So that expectation doesn't seem to hold true. Again, there's no real 20-year cycle. You're not stuck in this idea every 20 years there has to be change. But if you think about the, the extreme variance of the past and the way in which the past rarely meets expectations, when you're looking forward, keep this in mind, what you most expect may be what is least likely to occur. So let's move forward to what's shaping our world now. A couple of things. One, we are at a transitory period between what has been Europe at the, as the center of the world for 500 years to a time where the center of global power is shifting westward, moving over to North America and to the edges of Asia. So in the 1980s, uh, trans-Pacific trade matched and then started to exceed transatlantic trade. And that center of gravity is moving in the global system. For the past 30, 40 years, we had three pillars of the global economy and the global structure. We had the European Union, we had the United States, and we had China. Well, after 2008, 2009, we're seeing some substantial changes to that. So we're seeing a Europe that is not holding together in the same sense that the dream and the vision of the European Union was going to hold it together. That there are underlying fractures, and those underlying fractures have been there for a very long time, but at a time of economic prosperity, they were subsumed. But the reality is that trying to tell Greece that it needs to resolve its economic problems with the policies of Germany, a northern European industrial country versus a southern European Mediterranean agricultural country, that they're somehow going to have exactly the same uh, responses and tools to economic uh, uh, stimulus was, was not a very valid concept. And what's happened is that you see a reassertion of national interest. Um, it's coming through in nationalism, in, in uh, some sense in right-wing activity, uh, but really it's this reassertion of the national interest. And when you think about uh, the balance between uh, what are internationalists or globalizers, those who see a global world system as the ideal, right? but they're a very thin group of individuals who really act in a way in which their interests more align with similar people of similar economic and educational status in other countries than it does with the bulk of the people within their own country. And so you see this pushback, a nativist pushback against internationalism, and we're seeing that around the world. In, in you know, the, the Koreans were embarrassed by politics in Korea these days, but look what I'm coming from, right, and my presidential election. So uh, that, that nativism is, is pushing up very, very clearly uh, around the world. Um, we're seeing a real uh, breakdown in the way in which economic activity is taking place in Europe. And Europe, while the European Union may continue to hold together, it's not going to be building towards this extremely strong singular entity. We're seeing the ability of countries to set up borders and barriers again to the movement of individuals. That may add to the movement of goods and services again. 
And so the European Union may survive in some form, but it's not going to be that strong European Union. This pillar of the global economy is no longer holding up the system. We look at China, and China is now reaching the end of its natural economic cycle. If you think about any of the, the East Asian growth cycles, uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Southeast Asia, they run through these patterns where you have this rapid expansion, um, primarily focused on export and trade. Uh, that expansion is driven internally, often uh, not through the idea of profitability or strength of companies, but rather through the idea of constant turnover of revenue and expansion and growth and market share. The problem is that in a case like China or, or in some of these other countries, there is a fear of allowing businesses uh, to go under because that leads to unemployment and that causes underlying problems. So you allow these businesses to sustain themselves. You have companies that are borrowing money to pay payroll so that they can borrow money next week to pay payroll the following week. And over time, you let this deadwood build up, build up, build up in the system. If you think about fire prevention in a forest system, periodically you need fire in a forest because it burns out the brush and it allows the new growth to come up and it cleans that out. But if you don't allow that, that deadwood builds up and builds up and builds up and when you finally get a spark, it burns the whole system down and it may not recover for, for years or decades. Well, China is facing this. If you look at 2009, and then you look comparatively at 2014 at the expansion of NPLs, and this is just the numbers that you can actually get and officially get, and this is probably far underestimating the real issues and the real problems in China, that's a major issue. Secondarily, if you look at this, most of the economic activity in China takes place on the eastern coast. So in the first province in, and that's it, maybe even only within 60 miles in from the coast, okay? And we would, we would say maybe there's um, uh, four, 400 million uh, economically active Chinese in that, middle class, upper middle class. That's a ginormous number. That's a real word. Um, that's a very, very large number of people, uh, 400 million. But what you have to understand, if you are the Chinese government and you're trying to look at that 400 million whose eyes are looking more at the other upper and middle class people in other countries than they are at their own country, that you have 900 million people in the interior who are no longer the, having the promise of getting rich. And that really creates a major crisis in China on a scale that we don't see in any other country that has gone through this cycle. So China, while they're certainly going to continue to grow and expand and they're not going to disappear, is not going to be one of these massive pillars of the global economy in the same way that was during its growth period. Uh, wages on the coast have caught up. The idea of China being the competitive space for low-end manufacturing is not there. The Chinese don't want it, but it's starting to diffuse. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we go to the United States. <clears throat> the United States is not a great, great position, but by default it's the last of the uh, economic pillars. And one of the interesting things that the U.S. has had is the ability to focus on uh, just North America or North and South America on the Americas for its energy supplies, which gives it a new amount of strength. Um, but it's also the place where the Chinese are pouring all of their money. So if China is such a great bet for investment, why is all of the Chinese money coming into the United States? In the first half of this year, Chinese investments in the United States have exceeded the total of all investments last year. And this is only the official uh, Chinese direct investment. This doesn't count any of the hot money. This doesn't count any of the individual investments or things of that sort. So even though the United States may not be in the best position that it's ever been in, it's still seen as the one safety place. And it's not only the Chinese who are pushing money back into the United States, it's other countries as well. And so when we look at this, there's a major imbalance in the way the world system uh, is structured right now. There's also, because of this breakdown of China as the singular center of manufacturing, and it's going to be a slow breakdown, it's not happening immediately, it's not an instant cut, you have a diffusion of economic power and a diffusion of places where economics can start to move up in that chain. And we're seeing new clusters, skip Peru on this, I need to erase that, that didn't pan out. Um, but we're seeing clusters in the world, Southeast Asia obviously, right? Um, East Africa and East African integration that's starting to move up into that supply chain, into that low end components. Uh, Mexico, which is a very interesting country to keep an eye on, sits around 14th in, in GDP rank, um, has all levels of economic activity taking place inside the country and has an intimate link right into uh, North America for, for markets and investment. Um, we're actually seeing a reversal in the inflow 
of Mexican immigration into the United States. It's now slowed and is actually reversing. Most of the immigration coming through Mexico is coming from Central America because Mexico is providing new jobs. So there's no reason to run up to the United States. If you look forward uh, at ASEAN, ASEAN is one of the few places in the world that's, that's really clearly set to continue to grow not only in population but potentially in economic activity, which goes with that population growth. This is why there's so much focus on, on East Asia right now, the United States pivot to Asia, the Chinese looking at RCEP and, and other aspects of their trade agreements, um, the Europeans coming in, the Indians moving from look east to act east. At some point, they'll actually go east. Um, but all of these, this focus on, on Asia is because of the massive potential growth in these markets. And this is one of the few um, places that has room for a lot of activity, whereas other parts of the world, in Europe, in China, they may be flattening out in, in the sense of, uh, of that high levels of growth that's possible in, in this region. So let's move to now, and let's see what are some of the, what are some of the drivers of, of crisis and change that are going to be playing forward. So Russia, right? If you want to think of instability in the world, and, and at least from the United States, we look at Russia. Maybe over here not so much, but certainly from the United States. And when Russia looks out at its world, um, and yes, the map appears to be upside down, but I don't know why North has to be up. Um, when Russia looks at its world, it looks at a space that is very difficult to defend. Um, it has to push out not only to the Ural Mountains, because there's a huge gap between the Ural Mountains and when you get all the way down into, uh, into the, uh, the southern mountains there. So Russia ends up finding itself being compelled to push out into Central Asia, compelled to push out into Siberia. It pushes down to the Caucasus Mountains. It pushes out to the Carpathian Mountains. These are very natural places where Russia feels it has the space to defend itself. Well, when you see Russia make the move, for example, on Crimea, that's to keep access to the Black Sea. They need to keep the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, within their space so they don't get flanked. If you look at the Russian worldview and what they see, they see NATO moving closer and closer and closer to Russia. All of this is happening at a time where Russia is facing a pretty dire economic situation. Russia was very heavily focused on single uh, commodity economy. They knew they needed to break away from that single mod uh, economy, you know, gas primarily, oil and gas. Um, they had an intent to draw in European investment. The global economic crisis did not help them draw in European investment. And then having an uh, airline shot down certainly didn't help them draw in European investment. And instead did the opposite and threw sanctions on Russia and has held them off and held them off. This is why the Russians are doing the run on China and now on Japan and really trying to draw Japan in and offer this peace treaty with Japan to try to draw Japanese investment into eastern Russia. That gives Russia an ability at least to mitigate the potential decrease uh, in what it's doing in Europe and maybe even start to increase its economic activity. But for Russia, they're seeing a, a closing window where they are facing economic stress, they have a demographic crisis that's growing, and they see the Western world closing in on them and squeezing them in. And so right now they're pushing out to express as much of a border as they can, as far from their, their homeland as they can, to give themselves a bit of buffer space for when they have to deal with these crises. But this is rippling out to other places. So in Central Asia, um, a, a fairly large amount of money in Central Asia comes from remittances from Russia from Central Asians working in Russia and moving money back. As the, the price of uh, oil starts to fall and as the Russian economy starts to fall, the remittances start to fall, that creates problems in Central Asia. If you take the issues going on in the Middle East right now and have those slide over, not only through uh, Iraq and Syria, but slide into Pakistan, Afghanistan, and into Central Asia, where there have been these types of movements rise up before, you have uh, the added stress, uh, economic stress there, and then you have the aging Central Asian leaders who are dying off and not having a very clear succession plan, there is a very strong potential for a major crisis in Central Asia emerging. Well, that's going to draw the Russians in. That's going to probably draw the Chinese in who are worried about their western flank in Xinjiang. And that creates a space where either Russia and China have a strong opportunity to cooperate in international security, or their comp natural competition starts to rise up and they start to compete over Central Asian resources and over managing the Central Asian crisis. If we look over to the Middle East, uh, if you look at that little pink area, and this is not a perfect map, it's kind of designed just to give a concept rather than reality, but if you look at that little pink strip in the middle of Syria and Iraq, this is the Sunni area in the middle of a Shia area, okay? 
And if you think about where ISIS was able to spread, it's only in that pink area. Okay? There are natural boundaries where it could spread and it's starting to be pushed back. Well, why did it all flare up there when the United States liberated Iraq from itself? Um, uh, it, it failed to recognize that there are really three Iraqs. The borders do not match reality. There's northern Iraq, which is Kurdish, which has its own oil resources. There's southern Iraq, which is Shia, which has its own oil resources. And there's central Iraq, which is Sunni, which has sand. And central Iraq traditionally exploited southern Iraq and northern Iraq and maintained power. And when they were told they don't have power anymore, southern Iraq and northern Iraq refused to give the money. And they had nothing there, and it gave an opportunity for a group like IS to move into that space without opposition. And we're now seeing it push back. But this is spreading out to, um, to other areas. Uh, if you look at the changes too then, in top oil producers, that blue line there is the United States. And the United States oil production has increased substantially. And the Middle East oil production hasn't substantially decreased. But what it has done is lost some of its competitive balance. And therefore, we see the decline in oil prices because overall, you have this increase. You have a decrease in consumption, an increase in production. You're going to have a change in that. That hits these countries and their ability to manage the, the issues that they have going on within their own countries. And this is coming at a time, for example, where Saudi Arabia is trying to move away again from that overdependence on a single resource. It's working towards a Saudiization program, which is to replace all of the immigrant labor with Saudis. The Saudis are not keen on moving into that type of immigrant labor and uh, they're having a problem. But if you think about the decrease in economic activity in the Middle East, well, what else does that hit? Well, that hits countries like the Philippines. It hits countries like Bangladesh. It hits countries like Pakistan that have a large number of workers in this space who are either no longer sending remittances back or, in fact, being sent back to their own countries. So there are all sorts of double and triple ripples that come from any of these single issues that takes place. Let's look at the change in Chinese behavior. And if you look at this, and it's hard to read right there, but the red line is effectively consumption, and the green line is domestic production of key raw commodities. And the thing you'll notice is that in the 90s, basically what happens is you have a uh, massive spike in consumption, and you kind of don't keep up with production because you can't within your country. Well, that means that China moves from being a country that's largely self-sustaining internally to a country that's now heavily dependent on international maritime routes for its raw materials and for its exports. And this takes a China that's traditionally been a land power and focused on land and gets that country to focus on maritime. It has to look at securing its maritime routes. And many countries look around the world, and the United States is the only country that has the ability for its navy to interdict anywhere in the world at any time. And so the Chinese look at that, and they have three options. Their options are one, accept that the United States is the guarantor of the world's oceans, and hope that the United States doesn't decide to find some way to interfere with Chinese trade. Well, the Chinese are not going to believe that. Number two, um, build a strong navy to protect those routes. Well, that's a very hard thing to do, and as you're doing it, people see you as a rising threat, and they start to counter. But the Chinese are doing that in part. And number three is create as many redundant routes so that no one point is the place that you can be cut off, that you're absolutely dependent on any one place, the Strait of Malacca or any other place, so that you build as many land routes as possible, even if no single land route is economically viable, build them anyway. Tighten your integration through the land routes, tighten your shortcuts to the seas through Myanmar, through Pakistan. Um, and so China is running this two-fold strategy. The challenge is that China is changing the international status quo. And by changing the status quo, that creates the perception by other countries that China is aggressive, and therefore they start to act to counter that, which gives the Chinese the perception that everyone is aggressive to China and trying to contain them and constrain them, and so they push back. And so we have a very natural system. It is not a system that says this person is wrong or this person is right, but this is the reality of the way in which the world works. Look at Japan. So Japan is a country that is sat uh, in what most people would call economic malaise for some 20 years, 20 plus years. Uh, Japan has uh, the, the leading country for aging population. This is the place to watch on how it changes. Now, Japan has decided that it is no longer comfortable sitting and doing nothing. At the same time, the U.S. is starting after years of being engaged in Middle East war to reduce 
some of its international presence. That means it relies on its allies or, by default, other countries have to start standing up. As China expands, it puts a risk and a threat on Japan. Japan is rebuilding its military. That creates tensions for China. That creates tensions for Korea. Um, but this is the, the pattern that we're seeing. Japan is also one of the leading countries in um, learning to use uh, robotics and mechanization to replace uh, labor. Um, South China Sea, we'll jump through this really quickly, but there are unexpected things. So for example, you don't have a lot of fish anymore. Well, in this region, something like eight to 15% of uh, protein intake is from the sea, and everything is being overfished, and that's creating a lot of the frictions that you're seeing within this region. Let's jump further forward, and I know I got five minutes, we'll jump further forward into some of the things that are impacting this broader global system that may create major disruptions and major changes. Automation, everyone talks about automation and the changes in jobs. Well, it changes what they are, but it also changes the way in which you have to think about economies. I produce nothing except hot air. Um, there's no product, physical product I produce, but apparently I have economic value. So the concepts that we've used for years to think about economies and think about economics, which were based largely on the creation of real things and the movement of real things, is not there anymore. Um, let's look at robotics. So robotics allows you, in some ways, to supplement your workers. And this has been going on for years. This is not a new thing. This is an expansion of mechanization, right? Um, hand looms to power looms. Um, now we have uh, robots that can sew t-shirts, which was apparently a big leap in robotics. Uh, Bangladesh is about to go out of business. Um, there are big changes that come in societies from technological changes. The potential for expansion of grid storage uh, battery technology. Right now, um, alternative energies are fairly useless because they only work at certain times and you can't really store that energy and use it at the times you need. But if you could create disassociated grids or grids with battery storage that didn't lose substantial amounts of energy, you may be able to do for electricity production what cell towers did for communications. And you wouldn't have a blackout that blacks out half of India. You would be able to also utilize power in places that traditionally you wouldn't without having to run long power lines everywhere. But if you move to, say, a battery world, different minerals become more important. Let's say lithium becomes the most important mineral. Well, now Bolivia is the place that everyone starts fighting over, and Bolivia starts to decide that they need to invade Chile to regain access to the sea. The shape of the world, where we put our attention, where we put our focus, if you think about the world in the coal era, nobody cared about the Middle East. In the world of the oil era, everyone cares about the Middle East. So as certain commodities become more strategic, it changes where the world focuses its attention. Biggest issue coming up, changes in the growth of working age population, particularly in advanced countries. Uh, we're seeing that the uh, acceleration of population uh, for working age is starting to decrease. In countries like South, in Southeast Asia, in East Africa, there's still going to be growing working age populations. In other countries, even China, it's going to start to decline. Where today we fight about keeping immigrants out, in 20, 30 years, we may be competing over who gets to immigrate people to their country and who gets to draw them in. Um, mer world merchandise trade. The idea that international trade is going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing. It may be reaching a peak. As you change the technology that goes into manufacturing, you're able to onshore better. As you onshore better, think about additive manufacturing and the ability to, uh, instead of building 500 um, light switches in China and then putting them on a ship and shipping them across the ocean to the United States and then stocking them and selling them in a store, I go down to the store, I say I need a light switch, they go in the back room, hit the 3D print button and out comes my light switch. Well, their storage of material is very small, the transport cost is very short, so even if the labor cost is higher, the overall cost of the product is substantially smaller. And what that may do is for countries in Southeast Asia and East Africa that are depending on being the next suppliers of low-end manufacturing to the world, what if you remove that opportunity and that step? And that can really change the way we're thinking about these global economic patterns. Um, uh, trade agreements, uh, let me jump to demographics because this is a really interesting thing to think about it, uh, to come towards our close. Uh, anything in, in blue means you're not really growing your population. Anything in red means you've got lots of people, at least you have a lot of fertility. It doesn't necessarily mean your population is growing, they could all be dying as they're young. 
but you have a lot of growth in the world, and if you think back the old uh, dire expectations that by now we would have 100 billion people in the world and we would all starve to death, um, if you look now, look how much of the world is moving towards the non-replacement natural growth population. And if you go into the future, it's a substantial portion of the world. Now these can change and, and patterns can change, but there's been a natural move to decrease uh, population growth, particularly as economies grow. When you're a farming economy, every child is a net gain to your economic activity. When you're an urban economy, every child is a net drain on economic activity, and college students cost a lot and they don't give anything back, and for 30 years you've got to support them. So, so that changes uh, birthing patterns, that changes the way in which society works. So if we're going to come to a couple of uh, closings, again, it's not a 2020 crisis, but what are we seeing in the world? We're seeing an increasingly disorderly world. We're seeing a world that's trying to rebalance after it's been knocked out of alignment by the end of the Cold War and the shift of global power to North America and to the Pacific, and countries around the world are going to be readjusting to try to shape themselves in a way in which they can counter or at least exploit U.S. power. That means shifting alliances and sub-alliances when you watch what the Chinese are doing with economic activities, creating new monetary blocks or banking blocks or things of that sort. These are about trying to pull and ease some of that power off of the United States because the United States has disproportionate power. We're seeing a diffusion of economic power around the world not necessarily concentrated in single locations. Um, we're seeing uh, rising concerns of urban versus rural, uh, regional and sub-regional blocks forming, uh, reshoring and trade patterns changing. Um, and really overall then, a disequilibrium of the world. This is a world that's knocked out of alignment, that's going to be uh, very volatile over the next 10 or 20 years as it's reshaping itself and trying to fit itself into a space where it can accept not necessarily a unipolar United States, but a world that kind of can counterbalance that overpower of a single country. Thank you. Global and Yeki Yonzo, Mongaiton, more Kukje, Pange Pena, more Tawan Puameso, Junior Marsum Hedgingas Nida, more Aka Turisho Ketchman, Yelim Jongje than Quanchom Pakora, Wangon, or Chigun people of other channels to work at Chiman, Sangam Junior and Yaki Academia, so Motoisang Shinuri, Junja Jananda. 사실 그렇죠. 그리고 교육도 많이 줄어든다고 하는데 아까 말씀드렸겠지만은 3D 프린터로 그냥 앉은 자리에서 하니까 배로 나르고 비행기로 나르고 이럴 부분이 이제 예전보다 많이 줄어들고 당연히 교육 패턴이 변하겠죠. 그래서 우리가 미래 모습이 정확하게 어떻게 될지는 모르겠지만은 어, 지금 지금이 뭔가가 정말 바뀌고 있는 시점이다라는 거는 어렴풋하게 아마 좀 저희가 아, 들을 수 있을 것 같고 이따가 이제 저기 Q&A 세션에 더 많은 활발한 질문을 해주시고 뭐 지금 중국, 미국, 뭐 유럽 얘기 쭉 했, 하셨는데 아, 우리나라하고의 그 관계에 관해서도 전문가시기 때문에 뭐 질문이 있으시면 아, 기타 없이 해주시면 되겠습니다. 그럼 지금부터는 뭐두 번째 에, 연사이신 Peter uh, Everett, uh, direct managing director, uh, the leadership building. I have to say that 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 교역 상대국이 됐는데 어, 최근에 와서 이제 중국도 30년 가까이 지금 8% 이상 성장을 하면서 성장률 둔화는 좀 불가피해 보입니다. 베이스가 커졌기 때문에 그러면서 이제 에, 일종의 과잉 공급된 분야들이 꽤 나오죠. 우리 지금 문제가 되고 있는 산업 구조 조정 대상으로 되고 있는 뭐 철강, 뭐 조선, 석유화학 이런 분야들 우리하고 되게 겹치는 분야들이거든요. 그래서 
상당히 지금 빠른 속도로 우리보다 이제 우리랑은 좀 다르잖아. 요 사회주의 국가이기 때문에 어떻게 보면 우리보다 훨씬 빨리 앞서서 구조 조정을 지금 해 나가고 있는 것 같거든요. 그래서 어, 중국이 어떻게 변하고 있는지, 어떻게 혁신을 하고 있는지 정말 과거에는 저희가 상상하기 어려웠던 중국의 모습인데 우리보다 어떻게 보면 훨씬 더 그런 부분에서 지금 앞서 나가고 있다고 그래요. 아까 얘기를 들어보니까 그래서. 그런 실상에 대해서 좀 자세하게 듣고 뭐 끝나고 한꺼번에 디스커션 하는 그런 어, 세션 가지도록 하겠습니다. 그러면은 피처 에베렛 에, 뜨거운 박수로 어, 맞아주시기 바랍니다. 땡큐 미스 칸. 굿 아프터 눈 레이즈 앤 젠틀먼. Um, who has been to China over the last six months? Raise your hands. Who has been, never been to China before? Great. So if we look at it, there's about 15, 20% of the people who've not been to China, and there's about 20% of the people who have been to China over the last three months. I can recommend go there frequently because things change every six months. Uh, my name is Peter Everard and uh, I work with Corn Ferry. And um, Corn Ferry is an organization that exists for 46 years. We are dedicated to understanding leadership and talent and how leadership and talent will help organizations and societies stay relevant. How we help corporations to reinvent themselves so they can last longer. Personally, I work on innovative talent and leadership programs that help societies shape their future and reinvent themselves. Um, about 500 CEOs, thought leaders, and next practice leaders are the number of people I meet every year around the world. And we discuss what's going to happen in their business, what's going to happen uh, in regulatory affairs, what's going to happen in new technologies, and how those people see the future. So I've been privileged to meet many of the leaders in Korea, but also in China, in, in all parts of the world, actually. Um, I had the pleasure to become a member of a number of corporate think tanks on the future. And uh, in 2016, the, the Chinese pre presidency of the G20, B20, asked Corn Ferry to become the vice chair of the Employment Task Force. The key question we had to resolve is, how can we grow and now that we see a slowdown, uh, what are the things we need to do beyond the normal things we've been doing on trade, on compliance, on finance, on innovation? How can we grow? Uh, what can Corn Ferry do looking at talent and leadership to boost growth in the world? So we were uh, the vice chair of that task force. So I'll share some of the findings uh, that, that we got out of these uh, discussions. Um, I've been invited to talk about the leadership changes we observed in China. And uh, as uh, Mr. Kang already pointed out, it is by far the, the, the largest partner for, for South Korea in terms of trade. Um, for a few years, our company has observed how China uh, leadership, China talent has been evolving. Uh, you have to realize that on a daily basis, Corn Ferry places about 50 top executives in organizations every day and we assess about 400 leaders on a daily basis. So we have good insights on what is the, the kind of personality, the DNA of those leaders driving success. So, uh, we'll discuss um, China as an economic powerhouse and I'm going to take, for the sake of the debate, uh, partially agree and partially disagree with the previous speaker. We're going to look at China's smart growth strategy and we're going to look at skills and, and leadership. So I like to look at the glass half full and not the glass half empty. So China is an economic powerhouse. Um, if we look at uh, China, and uh, there I agree with uh, my, my, my colleague, um, the global GDP uh, is been slowing down and it continues to slow down. Uh, we're now on, on average around 3% and Korea is also around 3%. Uh, 
Uh, also, the China's economy has slowed down significantly, but with 6% economic growth, uh, China is, is still growing uh, three times as fast as uh, Germany, as Japan, as France, and twice as fast as, as Korea. Um, China also uh, still uh, represents a very significant and a more and more important part of the global GDP. You'll see here more than 15% of the world GDP is, is generated through China, uh, with 6% growth and a 1.4 billion population with a medium age of 37 years old. It's still the largest middle class uh, economy. And, and I think the, pre the previous speaker with 400 million people spending power, it is a significant, it's a significant amount of consumers uh, in China. Uh, we can state that China has become uh, a global uh, powerhouse for growth. And if you look at uh, purchasing uh, parity valuations, it even surpasses the United States. The demographics have been touched before. Uh, the medium age uh, in, in the world is around 30 years old. China is 37, South Korea 41. And you'll see that uh, Japan, like Germany, by the way, they are at the forefront of dealing with aging populations with medium ages of 47. And September, I was at the G20 B20 summit. And it inspired me to, to present you with the following findings on China's smart growth strategy. First, I was listening to the speech of President Xi Jinping. It was a remarkable speech where he discussed the evolution of China and he shared his vision uh, on the future. He highlighted the importance of open economies and emphasized China's investments to stimulate entrepreneurship and innovation amongst its own population. He also illustrated how China has evolved in terms of economic strength, how the average income has increased, and how 700 million Chinese got out of poverty over the last four decades. That is an amazing number, 700 million people partially to urbanization and industrialization, got out of poverty. Listening to the speech, I would summarize China's growth strategy as one that is clearly moving on from the traditional manufacturing industry to a more market and innovation-driven global economy. Today, and you see it on these pictures, um, we don't only see man the traditional manufacturing industry, where there's an overcapacity uh, right now, and a stronger focus on quality and on productivity. But for example, you see also the high-speed trains. Um, during the Olympic Games in Beijing, it was still Siemens and Alstom and GE that had world-class high-speed trains. That technology has been incorporated and been improved, and today China has actually the, be the best chances to be a, a technology leader when it comes to high-speed trains. Uh, there's not just uh, Silicon Valley, there's also uh, the Silicon Dragon uh, in Hangzhou. Uh, you have Alibaba and you see a lot of innovations taking place. It's, it's a real center for innovation and for entrepreneurship. Now, if we observe this, what has caused all this? Was it finance? Was it trade? What is actually underneath all this? So let us look a little bit on what are the, uh, the success factors, uh, the characteristics of successful leaders in China. So here we have to zoom into some of the methodology Corn Ferry used to analyze leadership. So for the B20, G20, already in 2015, we're starting using the data analytics of three million successful executives that we assessed. We assessed them across 21 countries and we analyzed what does it take to be successful as an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur in every country. 
We looked at the competencies of individuals. We looked at the experience of individuals. So this is what people do, what can be observed. But also we looked who those people really are in terms of personality, in terms of traits, and in terms of what motivates them, in terms of drivers. This online assessment tool that we used has been tested for over the last 10 years and it's scientifically validated. And um, what we see is there are significant differences between what is a successful leader and a successful entrepreneur in one country versus another one. So nothing, this has nothing to do with what is better or less good. It's just lines of what makes the best entrepreneur for a specific country. So let me first explain you on the, on the left-hand side of this slide. You see there uh, a summary of 67 different competencies that we analyzed from those three million executives. And some of them are related to the way we think, huh? that is the ones in green, it refers to thought, uh, thought leadership, it's like uh, understanding business, uh, creating the new and the different, uh, making complex decisions. The blue is the way we achieve results, uh, taking initiatives, managing execution, and focusing on performance are some of the competencies that reflect the results dimension. And then the orange is the way we deal with people. Uh, it's like building collaborative relationships, optimizing diverse talent, or influencing people. Finally, the purple is how we position ourselves. It has to do with, for example, being authentic, being open, and being flexible. You see in the gray on top, you see two gray arrows. The top one is learning agility, and the other one is emotional intelligence. So these were the most critical competencies for successful executives and entrepreneurs. Now, how did China compare to the average of the G20? The G20 is the gray line. And what you see there is China excels today, and this was not the case even five years ago, in uh, leaders that are more learning agile. Uh, they are more uh, taking more initiative. They're in general better in influencing other people. They have an open mindset. And they're flexible and adaptable. So the successful entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, successful executives in China, have shifted towards that kind of profile that allows them today to create a whole new economic tissue. So let's look a little bit again at what we said that economic tissue looks like. Predominantly today, we talk still about China as a manufacturing hub, a center of product production. Uh, we see it evolving to China adaptive and China generative. Let's, let's look at some of the characteristics that underpin those different scenarios, because all three will exist at the same time. So if we look at productive leadership in China, it's the result um, of, it's resulting in, in superior productivity in manufacturing and process industries. There's a focus on repetition of producing quality products and making this scalable using lean processes. Uh, critical uh, characteristics of a productive leadership, leadership environment is typically the focus is on scaling up, uh, repeating uh, quality production. It's often product and process driven. Um, uh, there's a high focus on uh, price, uh, price and quality. Uh, management is often given KPIs so they can drive efficiencies, uh, Kaizen principles get in place. Often these organizations are also more hierarchical and top-down. A lot of the Korean manufacturing industries are having the same kind of... Do you recognize this? You see this also in Korea, uh, I think. And there's more characteristics like that. Now, if we look at the adaptive leadership, we, we've seen China go to market with new products that were inspired on Western original designs. So every year I go to the Beijing Auto Show, you know, and I've been there for the last seven years. And every year I see 
the Chinese car manufacturers getting closer, overtaking uh, or getting closer to the Europeans or getting closer to the Koreans. They start building decent cars. They, it's like with the trains. They're starting to build superb products that are not just for the local market relevant, but can become relevant internationally. So we've seen those new products often inspired on Western original designs, um, but we see them also focus on products that are not just for the market today, but are relevant for the markets of tomorrow. So in the adaptive leadership cultures that China is fostering, uh, they developing talent and leaders that can tweak and refine existing products. People that are more market-centric and they can compete with other nations and other uh, products on, on relevance. It requires a whole new management philosophy and who education of your management uh, culture, which is dealing more on management insight. And you have to empower more locally uh, and open up for ideas that can be relevant uh, closer to your customers. So in that environment, managerial insight, learning agility, and interpersonal skills have become more important as the organization solicits local insights close to the market. Now, when in Hangzhou for the B20, G20, we were very close to the headquarters of Alibaba. And Hangzhou has really become the Silicon Dragon. Uh, it's, it's about seven million people, but it's a center of software development and disruptive innovations. It is one of the, the places in China where we see generative leadership. And generative leadership requires managerial courage. It requires risk-taking. It requires the openness to innovate and allowing to fail. Failing is an issue. It's an issue in a lot of Asian countries. I've been living in Asia for uh, six, seven years now, and I've been dealing with Asia for the last 15 years. And like you know, other cultures, like in Germany, for example, we, we have strong cultures of perfection. Failure is not an option. Do you recognize that in Korea? You know, in America, you go bankrupt, uh, you can start up your company, you get another loan. I think in, in Europe, or in the country I come from, from Belgium, you're bankrupt, you get, you know, eh, nobody will give you a second loan, you're a loser. We, we don't have a really uh, risk-taking culture, not a really entrepreneurial culture, and it's deeply entrenched in, in the way we've been groomed to be improving on efficiency, on quality, on great, on execution. Now, China, you know, high discipline in learning, it's changing. Uh, it's changing, it's, it's, it's the way it educates people, it, 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 the way it allows people to take risk. The traditional top-down leadership styles and the hierarchical structures are not really condu con conducive to generative leadership scenarios. And we see China applying more distributed leadership and starting to compete on uniqueness. So today, if you look at 2015, top 25 innovative companies of Forbes, you will see, and there I agree with you, you will see predominantly American companies. It's 80%. You see two Korean companies on that list. And you see one Chinese, a Shanghai biomedical company on that list. But this is, I predict this is going to change. I think simply by market opportunity, by Xi Jinping's focus on clean water, clean environment, sustainable business, and on open economy by Chinese investments, not only state-owned investment, but privately owned companies investing in foreign innovation and buying assets uh, in, in innovative countries, they are learning. And they are going to become more adaptive in their leadership. They're going to become more generative in the future. It could be a possible explanation also why you see so many investments in the United States. Uh, I just, I'm moving to Silicon Valley in January. I try to buy a house there. You know, I'm competing with all the Chinese there that buy all cash. It's a disaster. It's very difficult to buy a house right now in Silicon Valley. I'm getting out, out, out bit every time by the Chinese. Now I found some, something finally. But what we believe is that in the near future, more Chinese brands and uh, Chinese innovators will rank amongst uh, the top uh, on Forbes. Now, uh, some conclusions, what can we take away from this? Um, three con conclusions. First of all, growth 
may not just be in the market. It may not just be in the statistics. It may be in the mindset. Growth lies in the people. Growth is in the leaders, entrepreneurship and innovation. Within the G20, B20, Corn Ferry is proposing an experiment, a social experiment. We state that the most important precursor to economic growth is developing entrepreneurship, teaching people how to undertake and create a business. 3.2 billion people have today access to the internet. Soon 5 billion people will have access to the internet. They become aware of what is possible. They can read and learn what's going on in the world. They long for things. They see things are there and they want it as well. It put pressures on governments. More and more it becomes difficult for governments to govern because the population is better educated, is even better informed or faster informed. I wouldn't say better informed, but you know, reads more about stuff that can be true or not true, but it's difficult to falsify it if it's in the internet and you have always to run behind the facts. So it's pressure on governments all over the world because of the digital generation. Well, can we engage with all those smart people and help them to understand that governing is not uh, uh, something which is done in isolation, it's done by engaging with the population. We heard it this morning in the General Assembly, the speeches of the former Prime Minister of Ireland. There needs to be a dialogue and we have the opportunity to organize that dialogue differently between the population and their leaders, and not just at the local level, but at an international level. That's why Corn Ferry says, look, let's drive an experiment. Let's create 60, let's take 60 companies from the G20 nations. Give us 60 entrepreneurs, randomly chosen. Some will be startups, other will be mid-size, and other ones will be scaling up globally. But even the ones who start up, and that will create a plumbing company that employs five people, that's six families that have a meaningful job. Let's put them through a program how we can boost entrepreneurship and measure their success. Because if we can build entrepreneurs faster and with higher efficiency and higher chances of success, it will be easier to finance their endeavors and we'll get a higher return, uh, economic return on them, and as well we'll create more meaningful lives. And we predict that the next generation of leaders, they will indeed have multiple careers, but they may even work at the same time for multiple employers. It doesn't mean that the traditional hierarchical productive structure, the productive era, will be abandoned. No, we should not give up on that. That still needs to be there. Uh, but you, you have to think about alternative ways of organizing that speaks to the imagination and to the potential and the interest of the digital natives. Talent is no longer in your backyard, it's everywhere. How, the ones who are able to connect the dots across the globe will probably outperform. So what can you do in an area where there's no growth in the market? Well, I'd say learn from China and explore exactly how we can boost entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship in large corporations and innovation so we ensure that organizations stay relevant. That's the second conclusion. The third conclusion, well, it's not just because we need more innovation that we should forget about the virtue of manufacturing. Societies and corporations are likely to be at their best when they recognize the talent mix that they have in their population. We need people that fit the productive scenarios, others will fit the adaptive scenarios, and others will fit the generative talent uh, scenarios. The art consists in matching the skill set with the smart growth opportunity. In short, our recommendation to all who can influence leaders in the world and all who can influence CEOs as well as all who actually watch the future generation and help them to succeed is please encourage the adoption of a next practice or growth mindset. A next practice mindset is think about it every month, every year, what we're doing we can do better. We can do it differently or we can do it better linearly or non-linearly, which means linearly increase what we're doing in a better way 
or in a disruptive way, stop what we're doing and do things that are more relevant. So adopt a next practice and growth mindset. That's my first recommendation. The second one is do understand your core strengths. A lot of organizations and individuals do not know what they're really good at, what makes them exceptional. Gordon Ferry looks at that all the time, what makes people exceptional compared to others, to peers. But once you understand that, it's going to become easy what to focus your time on, what to do and what not to do. Then f the third thing to do is indeed look at the opportunity and build on your core competences your career or your organization. So you can prolong the expiry date of your talent or as an organization, reinvent yourself and cheat death. Try and try again. Thank you. Yeah, 감사합니다. Uh, 뭐 지금 피터 에베렛 디렉터신데 매니징 디렉터신데 뭐 지금 세 가지 측면에서 뭐 영어로는 이제 뭐 프로덕티브 리더십, 생산적인 리더십 그리고 어 어댑티브 리더십 뭐뭐 아까 대응력이라고 번역을 하셨던데 뭐 하여튼 적응을 잘하는 거죠. 그런 리더십 그리고 어 제너러티브 리더십, 뭐 창조적 리더십이라고 번역을 하셨는데 이세 가지가 아주 이제 중요하고 저도 사실은 좀그 의아한 게 이제 그런 면에서 아까 그 G20 평균하고 비교를 해보니까 중국이 대부분의 뭐 기준에서 평균보다 높다고 나왔죠. 그래서 우리는 뭔가 이런 생각이 좀 들고 우리도 한번 평가를 받아볼 필요가 있지 않나 정말 우리가 이렇게 뒤떨어지고 있는 건가 그런 생각이 좀 들었어요. 그리고 또한 가지는 뭐 아까 말씀하신 대로 이제 중국도 그랬고 아시아권 뭐 유럽도 그렇다고 그러시니까 이제 퍼펙트한 거를 그러니까 완벽주의를 뭐 추구한다 다른 말로 하면은 실패를 용납하지 않는다는 거죠. 그런 게 이제 깔려 있기 때문에. 제기할 수 있는 여지가 없으니까 리스크 테이킹을 하기가 좀 어렵잖아요. 그러니까 창업이 자연스럽게 좀뭐 어려워지는 뭐 이런 상황이었는데 중국이 이제 거기서 좀 많이 변하고 있는 게 우리한테는 실질적으로 이제 뭐 위협이 되기도 하고 어떻게 보면은 좀 배워야 될 점인 것 같기도 하고 그렇거든요. 그래서 뭐좀 시간이 허락이 된다면 좀 자세하게 그런 그 어떤 제기 여건 뭐 실리콘밸리 같은 데하고 우리가 맞비교하기는 어렵지만은 어 저는 개인적으로 그게 되게 중요하다고 생각하거든요. 그러니까 우리나라가 지금 뭐 대기업 중심으로 전통 굴뚝 산업 지금 20년째 산업 구조가 안 바뀌고 있는데 거의 한계에 봉착한 것 같아서 당분간 그냥 그런 대로 가긴 하겠지만은 이게 점점 우리가 가라앉고 있다는 그 위기가 정말 무슨 저 97년도 IMF 소위 IMF 위기라고 하는 것처럼 팡 터져버리면 사람들이 정말 위기의식을 갖는데 요즘은 위기 같은데 그런 위기의식을 잘 너무 이렇게 서서히 가라앉기 때문에 못 느낀다는 느낌을 좀 받거든요. 그래서 그런 것들이 차제에 좀 정리가 됐으면 하는 뭐 그런 생각입니다. 그래서 지금은 이제 그 플로어에서 질문들을 좀어 적어주셔서 제가 좀 읽고 뭐 이렇게 해야 되는데 그냥 한번 몇개좀 질문을 드리겠습니다. 지금 질문하신 것 중에 하나가 이제 글로벌 위기에 대해서 말씀을 해주셨는데 그런 상황 속 기업의 리더가 아니라 조직원의 입장에서는 그러니까 리더가 아닌 이제 그 조직의 일원이죠. 조직원의 입장에서는 어떤 준비가 아, 글로벌 위기에 대해서 준비가 필요한지. 아, 그래서 지금 이건 두분다 해당되는 질문이신데 지금 상황 속에서 조직원 입장으로 돌아간다면 뭘 하겠는가라고 어, 재정민 씨가 아, 질문을 하셨어요. 그래서 그 질문 음, 잠깐 좀 답변을 해주실 수 있나요? 로저 베이커 부사장께서 
간단히 답변 좀 부탁드립니다. Sure. So, if we were to look at as a as a regular person, I guess is what the question is, rather than as a boss or as a national leader, what to do? Um, the first thing I would argue is to try to understand the world a lot better. Um, there's a the you know, in the discussion that was raised a little bit about the availability of information. There's a great amount of information available. The challenge is that the way in which we consume information is creating narrow, narrow groups of individuals who share one agreed idea, and they keep moving themselves into that narrower, narrower space and not being able to engage in a broader dialogue. I think structurally, if you look at the way in which, uh, particularly in urbanization and the change in the ways in which uh, uh, business is concentrated into particular areas. Uh, where we live and where we work are different. The community that we live in and the community that we work in are not the same, and therefore our engagement often gets narrowed down to the people who also work in the same space that we work in and the same type of job that we work in. So again, our worldviews get narrower and narrower, and although there's more information available, um, the wonderful algorithms we have increasingly give us only the information that fits what we're interested in seeing, and therefore, again, our worldviews become constrained. So I think one of, the, one of the most important things is to try to have a broader worldview, try to understand multiple perspectives of, of what's going on in the world, how different individuals see different things, so that you're more flexible when you're faced with challenges. I, I uh, like to build on that in a line. Um, 2020 is tomorrow. So there's two things to do. First, there needs to be a boost program. Boost entrepreneurship and boost entre uh, innovation. How do you do that? You have major corporations in Korea. So you have to build on your strengths first. And you need to define what are the topics that in the short term can bring benefit to South Korea. Co topics like that could be robotization, digitization. It could be dealing with a more complex globalization and more complex trade and regulatory system. It could be topics like entrepreneurship and innovation by itself. I would advise the larger corporations and in Korea to start tomorrow with a program which is focusing on next practices and organize series of workshops and think tanks not just with individuals from within your industry or from within South Korea or from within Asia but from next practice leaders from around the world. I see a lot of companies doing benchmarking in their silos when they're aerospace and defense, when they're automotive, when they're in energy, oil and gas, when they're in chemicals, in pharmaceuticals or life sciences there, or financial services, they're really benchmarking and trying to improve and, and they benchmark without looking at the overall picture and looking at global disruption that is coming. I would, in that boost program, I would create next practice workshops and programs that would give them an elevated view on uh, the landscape uh, of global economy and global opportunity as it becomes more uncertain and that is a boost program in the short term. In the long term my recommendation is start already with your educational system. Um, in China we recommended that the educational system uh, is be reformed in such, a, in such a way that it aligns with entrepreneurship and innovation. How do you do it concretely? Imagine you're 14 years old, you're at school. You are asked uh, to set up a little enterprise and learn how to trade with your person in the classroom, trading candy for homework or for beverage or for playing together, whatever. When you're 16, you do it with another school in your country to learn the importance of trading and entrepreneurship and dealing with people that are not in your immediate proximity. And before you're 18, we want you to work on a digital platform. Well, you'll set up a company, an enterprise, with a person with similar interest in another country. So to stimulate entrepreneurship already at young age, that people become more prepared to be agile, to adapt in risk-taking. So short 
boost program on next practices with major corporations, a collaboration between leading corporations, thought leaders from your educational centers. You have fantastic educational center here in, in Korea and also sponsored by the government. Those three parties need to put that boost program in place to make sure we can make an impact by 2020. Long term, start reforming your educational system. And as a result of that, also your management and your leadership styles will start to evolve. Every father has a son and a daughter uh, or a daughter of 14, 15, 16, 18 years. It'll lead to contamination. Uh, well, 경제 성장이 지금 상당히 많이 됐거든. 30년 8%라고 우리 기록을 깼기 때문에 경제 성장이 많이 이루어진 이후에 어떤 정치 민주화에 대한 요구 이런 것들이 충분히 있을 수 있고 그게 공산당 그 체제 하에서 과연 수용이 가능할 수 있나 장기적으로 어떤 어 우리가 경험했던 이런 어 고도 성장의 결과에 can you answer to this question about the... So if I were to look at that, um, if you look at China and Chinese economic growth, Ch uh, the Chinese economy and Chinese society has changed substantially over the past 30 years. And Chinese politics has changed almost none in that time. And the gap between economic change, uh, societal change, and political gain uh, change is growing greater and greater as we look forward. So I think this is part of why you see this reconcentration of power in the Communist Party to try to break the Communist Party <laughs> from the inside to hope that they can change and adapt before it's pushed and broken from the outside. But I think that's a major challenge for them. And this type of uh, economic imbalance, the, the promise in China, the political promise during the economic growth period, which violated many of the fundamentals of the political system and the political ideology, was that don't worry, everybody will eventually get rich. Um, just some of you are going to have to wait longer. And the reality that they've now reached is the point that yes, Many people are out of poverty. Everybody has increased some, but the difference, the, the, the gap in China is massive when you look at things like the Gini coefficient or when you just look at reality um, in the different parts of China, that I think that that stress on politics is very strong. And in the end, I, I would expect that the political system will try to consolidate. And so when you see the government pushing uh, nationalism, uh, pushing actually increased control in media and media distribution, um, trying to shape the way in which the perception of China moves from we're only going to talk about the CPC to talk about 4,000 years of Chinese history so we all need to be Chinese and try to draw in the, um, the, the Chinese expatriates. I think that that's all a reflection that it's very, very difficult uh, in my view for the party to be able to continue in the same political structure that it has but right now it's fighting for its life. Yeah, thank uh, you. 지금 로저 어, 베이커 씨한테 질문이 왔는데 어, 뭐 지금 한국에서 글로벌 인재로 성장하기 위해선 앞으로 개발도상국에 가서 사업을 펼치는 게 좋은지 어, 아니면 우리보다 선진국에 가서 문화와 사업 흐름을 배워서 한국에서 펼치는 게 좋은지 의견을 좀 부탁드린다고 어, 그리고 또한 가지 곁들여서 지금 뭐 다른 질 다른 분이 질문하신 건데 
아주 심플합니다. 영어하고 중국어 중에 하나만 열심히 하려면 어떤 걸 해야 되냐 뭐 이런 질문이 있었습니다. 但是在default的时候，我们现在改变了，它已经变成了拉丁，它原来是英语，它原来是法语，它原来是英语，它原来是英语，它原来是英语，它原来是英语，它原来是英语，它原来是英语，它原来是英语，它原来是英语，它原来
계속 지금 확장적으로 되고 있는 거가 어, 우리한테 사실 많은 부분에서 영향을 미치지만 은뭐 어떤 부분에서 가장 큰 영향을 미칠 걸로 어, 생각을 하시는지 그리고 한국이 이제 그런 부분에 대해서 어떻게 대응을 해야 되는지 조금 더 제가 부연 설명해서 구체적으로 말씀을 드리면 은 질문 의도가 뭐 경제적으로 나오는 아까 말씀드린 것처럼 뭐 우리의 제1 파트너가 된지 이미 꽤 됐고 어 지금 남북 문제가 걸려 있기 때문에 우리가 뭐 북핵 문제를 포함해서 어 사드 배치 문제도 있고 그래서 좀 갈등도 어느 정도 있는 건 사실이거든요. 그러면서 여기 다른 분들이 질문한 거하고 같이 포함하면 중국이 또 영토 분쟁도 나름 지금 일으키고 있는데 우리하고는 그런 문제는 없지만 은 지금 중국이 이뭐 가까우면서도 어떻게 좀 그렇다고 뭐 북한하고 우리하고를 놓고 봤을 때 중국이 어떻게 우리를 지금 대하는지 뭐 이런 거에 대해서 사실 저희가 민감하거든요. 그래서 어 그런 거에 대해서 그러니까 요약을 하면 은 중국이 지금 뭐 커가고 있는 G2로서의 입지를 구축하고 있는 게 한국한테 어떤 부분에서 가장 큰 영향을 미칠 것 같고 우리가 어떻게 한국이 거기에 대해서 어떤 식으로 대응을 해야 될것 같냐라는 데 대한 의견을 좀 부탁드립니다. 두 분은 한 시간? 오케이. So we'll do a really, really sh uh, a short version, and we can do this on the sidelines later if we want longer discussions on this. Um, look, there, there's a reality that there's a change in the structure of regional power. And this has happened at different times in history. And this has happened from different sides of Korea. And there's, there's no, uh, it's, it's no, you know, not for nothing that there's that old uh, minnow between whales uh, analogy for Korea being stuck. Um, Korea is the, the bridge between China and Japan. It's the, it's the blockade between China and Japan. Both countries are large. Both countries are rising. rising both countries are expanding. Um, Korea really has had a couple of traditional paths to deal with. One is simply accept Chinese regional power in a nominal way, the old uh, tributary system, right? I'll give you three virgins and a horse. You recognize that I'm my own country and we leave each other alone. Um, and that's very difficult to do in the modern era. Because China doesn't see the 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 Korea can be Korea can't be isolated any longer in that sense, and in that structure, in many ways, Korea was an isolated country but on purpose and intentionally. Um, Korea's economic growth and structure is now geared outward, and therefore, just like we saw with China needing to find ways to secure its its access to international resources, international markets, Korea is the same thing. So Korea's option that it chose was to align itself with the United States and guarantee that that element uh, provided it its security. I think that for Korea, it's in a, in it's a very difficult place. Uh, if you looked under Kim Dae-jung, under Noh Mu-hyun, uh, it was really about Korea first. Can Korea build independent strength, independent capability? When we changed over to uh, Im Young Park and uh, uh, Park Geun-hye, it changed back into, let's pull back into that alignment with the United States, partially driven by economic realities, by the idea that Korea um, independently right now is not strong because it has a vulnerability with its relationship with North Korea and because it's heavily dependent on those international trade routes. So I don't think Korea has a great option. Um, and THAAD is one of these great examples, right? If China really didn't want THAAD, all China would need to do is exert greater influence over North Korea's missile development, which they have the capability to do but have chosen not to do because they don't want to take the other risks that come with that to their international position and how they deal with other countries and also to the potential destabilization of the space. So shorter answer is I didn't answer your question, but we can talk about it later. <laughs> um, I think this this word is, is is getting too small and it can be destroyed all over. I don't. I, do, I run workshops workshops and think tanks on the future of peace in war, and real world and in cyber reality. Um, and we had um, tr very interesting speakers from military and from from corporate and from security um, exchanging views on this. Uh, the solution lies in uh, education, diplomacy, and trade. So invest in understanding, exchange. Um, there is no other path. The threat will not come from the major nations in the G20. 
uh, when war gets triggered, it'll take another dimension. In, uh, and otherwise, it will be tactical skirmishing. But uh, history, as we've seen it in World War II, uh, will not repeat itself as such, we think. It'll be coming from extreme groups uh, that will have their hands on technology nobody should have their hands on. So for what I can say is diplomacy, trade, exchange, understand each other, and the Chinese are willing to invest in that. Uh, we asked uh, the families uh, in America and in China, um, how important is it for your children to learn about other cultures? China, 40%. America, 15%. How important is it to, for your children to learn math and exact sciences? America that big, China that big. How important is it to learn entrepreneurship? China that big, America that big. Two major nations in the world controlling about over 30% of the worldwide GDP have def very different views and perceptions on what is the right thing to do. The only thing we can hope is that there's enough smart people and the next generation that is willing to listen to each other and exchange ideas and points of view. And that's why we need to start with that on education, young age, go overseas, digitally overseas, to start doing things together in a meaningful way. There's no shortage. In it. There's no problem with economic growth. It's only a problem of mindset. Yeah. 감사합니다. 지금 뭐 지금 플로어에서 나온 질문은 뭐 대부분은 이제 다 여쭤봤고요. 답변도 들었고 사실 이제 어떤 주제들은 뭐 시간이 충분히 많이 주어진다면 어 자세하게 더뭐 논의를 하고 싶지만은 주어진 시간이 지금 다 됐기 때문에 일단 뭐 경청을 해 주셔서 감사드리고 어뭐 개인적으로 저도 궁금한 게 많습니다. 뭐 이분들이 과연 한국의 리더십 특히 이제 기업 그 대표적인 기업들에 대한 리더십을 어떻게 평가하는지도 궁금하기도 하고 아까 말씀드린 것처럼 뭐 우리나라가 잘 되려면은 뭔가 이제 엔터프레이너십 이노베이션 이런 부분이 강조가 되고 그게 실천으로 옮겨줄 수 있는 여건이 좀 조성이 돼야 되는데 어떤 부분에서 뭐 부족한지 남들은 왜 잘하는지 뭐 이런 걸좀더 세세하게 듣고 싶었지만은 뭐 시간이 다 돼서. 뭐 다음 기회로 미루기로 하고 하여튼 장시간 동안 뭐 아주 열심히 들어주셔서 감사드리고요. 발표해 주신 두 분한테 다시 한번 뜨거운 박수 보내드리겠습니다. <웃음>